I'm also a big believer that marketing and sales need to talk a lot because marketing, in my opinion, really needs to be the voice of the customer at the executive level. So mm -hmm. by having sales and marketing better connected, marketing leaders can have more access to hear what current clients and potential clients are talking about. What are their mm -hmm. problems? What are the trends in the market? What are the things that they are trying to solve so that, again, you can create better content that leads in the early stage in the funnel. You can help better messaging, all of those things. Welcome to the Show Me The Data podcast by Leadsyn, where every week we get marketing and sales leaders from fast growing B2B tech companies to share specific tactics they use to drive revenue for their business. The best part, they share the exact metrics and data points behind each of their tactics. I'm your host, Tukhan Das, the co-founder and CEO of Leadsyn. See you there. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Tukan from Leadsip here. My guest today is Dave Carr. Dave's the VP of Marketing and Business Development at Click.io. Welcome to the show, Dave. Hey, thank you so much. Glad to be here. Awesome. So before we get, get started, Dave, um, I guess if you want to give the audience a quick overview of what you guys do at Click, um, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah. So uh, as you mentioned, I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Business Development. Just a little background on me and before I get into the company. So I have been in sales and marketing for about 14 years in my career. I started out with General Electric and their energy division was there for about a decade in sales. So I led a $35 million sales region. I managed uh, channel sales for the Eastern United States for a period of time and then left that role and ran corporate marketing for a large electrical distributor called Mayer in the Southeast U.S. So I led them through a rebranding process and that was really my conversion from sales to marketing. <clears throat> so from my point of view, I look at sales and marketing alignment very differently because I spent so much time in sales before <laughs> I came to marketing. So I'm really excited to talk about the topic. In terms of Click.io, we are a sales enablement platform. And basically, if, if you're not familiar with sales enablement, uh, it's a software system that takes marketing content, sales content, presentations, training content, and it aligns that to salespeople when and where they need it. So for instance, we plug into salesforce.com, we can recommend presentations to salespeople before they go to a meeting, and we can even recommend what to share with their customers after the meeting, uh, as well as how to prepare and, and all the steps in between. Um, so sales and marketing alignment is what we do. That's the main problem that we focus on, and we'd be happy to give you some examples of that in our discussion today. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, I know we are going to talk definitely about the key theme is to talk about sales and marketing alignment, but before that... I guess we can start off by asking in your role as VP of marketing and business development, what are the different strategies that you guys are currently executing on uh, to drive demand at Click? Yeah, great question. So being that we are predominantly a content company, that's what we do. We deliver content to salespeople. We eat our own dog food per se, right? So we create yeah. a lot of content. Uh, and we do that through a variety of ways. I mean, blogging, of course, from an SEO optimization standpoint to help with inbound. We also create a lot of eBooks. Um, one thing that we found that that's really performed well for us is when we create more in-depth content like roadmaps. Uh, so one of our top performing pieces of content, we have a 2021 roadmap for industrial sales and marketing outlines five big key things that, that trends that are happening in the environment and data that we've collected from our own research that supports where the market is going. That performs really, really well. Hmm. Uh, we've also in the past used things like benchmark surveys. Mm -hmm. So we would run paid ad campaigns where we allow companies to take a quick survey that, that benchmarks where they are in sales and marketing alignment. And then we report them back and give them uh, an overview of how they compare to others in the marketplace. So again, we try to use our content where number one, it's either educational, it provides some sort of value so that the, the client or the prospect can get some information about where they sit relative mm -hmm. to, to the market. Um, and then other pieces of content are more you know, general. You know, we'll have checklists or things that may help people get started with sales enablement or understand how to uh, even begin building a sales enablement team. So anything that provides value uh, from the content is where we really see high performance. So you guys do a lot of your demand gen for via content marketing. C correct. We do. And so we do that through a variety of ways, but the biggest really is paid for us. So we do a lot of LinkedIn advertising It's probably 80% of our pipeline comes from LinkedIn. 
uh, Google and YouTube as well. We've seen a lot of performance from YouTube recently, just from, yeah, so running uh, short ads ahead of videos. And so we can do that with more precise targeting to look at uh, people who have intent, who have had, you know, searches related to sales enablement or to sales technology. And so we can place those video reels ahead of, uh, ahead of YouTube videos. Perform really well for us on demo conversions. The one thing I always like to reiterate is, you know, you, you have to think about, you know, are, are, you, are you creating a piece of content or using a channel for awareness or are you trying to capture intent? Yeah. Uh, and if you try to do them the other way around, it doesn't work well. <laughs> Absolutely. But if, if you can use uh, the high intent on conversions to things like demo, it's, we've seen that perform well. But majority is paid. Uh, some of it, of course, is through organic. We try to share you know, at least once a day on, on LinkedIn and social, get a lot of click through on Twitter, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. So not as much, you know, interactions or conversations, but we do see a lot of clicks to articles through Twitter. So combination of paid organic. Great. So now let's, let's come to the main topic of our, our discussion today, which is around sales and marketing alignment. And um, so I guess one, when I hear of the term sales and marketing alignment, um, in theory, it, it, it makes sense you know, sales and marketing should be aligned, but what does it mean in practice? Can you give a few concrete examples, Dave, of what an example of a sales and marketing team being aligned actually means? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think right before I get into that, let me give you some examples of why it's important as well. Yeah, Just sure. Points. So one of the things we focus on very, very heavily is how much of the buyer cycle happens before interacting with sales. And I'm sure you, your listeners, if you're listening to this, you've probably heard these numbers thrown around before. 70% is a yeah. common number that's been thrown around a lot. I, yeah. I would argue that post COVID that's probably closer to 80 because we saw so much shift in, in digital and self-service yeah. throughout the pandemic. Yeah. In fact, we, we were looking at some Aberdeen research recently that actually says that I think it was like 82% of sales and marketing executives now believe these new ways of buying are here to stay. So for instance, less sales travel, more virtual selling, more Zoom meetings, more digital engagement. So just by the nature of that, you know, it's it's driving the need for sales and marketing alignment because so much of the, the buyer interaction happens before your sales team is ever there, right? Yep. And that's marketing. That marketing owns that early part of the pipeline through awareness, through brand, through content, all of those mm -hmm. things that that power that Google search when people have intent. So that's a huge reason. We're seeing buying committees get much, much larger. Mm -hmm. uh, we now see that those buying committees are made up of up to 73% millennials. When you look mm -hmm. at people around the table in those buying committees, we all know that millennials buy very differently. They focus much heavier on early stage online research before making those purchases. Mm -hmm. I could throw more data points at you, but like 38%, you know, companies with good sales and marketing alignment typically drive somewhere around 38% higher revenue than their competitors that do not have sales and marketing alignment. So there's, there's just so many reasons in the modern world that you have to make that shift. Sure. The area that I've seen the biggest challenge for that is more traditional B2B. So what I mean by that, like industrial businesses, uh, distributors, if you're a distributor of product or more in the middle of the supply chain, long sales cycle, more complex B2B businesses traditionally have not had great sales and marketing alignment because they really didn't have to, right? It was more relationship based. It was more product centric, but now we're seeing all that go out the window. We're moving yep. to solution based products. Most of those products, especially in the industrial world are becoming connected. So they're all cloud-based, there's data collection, there's all these things around that that make it more of a solution. So anyway, I know that's sort of a little bit of a tangent, but I want to paint the picture of why that is important. So how does how does sales and marketing alignment really work? Yeah. Well, yeah. well, the first part is you, you have to align your goals and objectives. So from the time that you understand, you know, where you want to direct your sales and marketing team, if you don't understand at the most basic level, like who your ideal customer profile is, mm -hmm you are not setting yourself up for success. True. <laughs> and so that typically begins with marketing, which is, you know, by nature, more focused on data, more focused on segmentation. So having sales and marketing leaders aligned to saying, okay, who is our ideal target market? Yep. How does our solution wrap value around that segment of the market? And then using marketing to help create messaging and both messaging for content, but also for salespeople. So as an example, like in our business, mm -hmm. um, I get heavily involved in helping even our sales team craft their messaging, whether it's through their outbound campaigns 
or having sound bites that they can use during sales call. We're heavily connected to that. I'm also a big believer that marketing and sales need to talk a lot because marketing, in my opinion, really needs to be the voice of the customer at the executive level. So mm-hmm. by having sales and marketing better connected, marketing leaders can have more access to hear what current clients and potential clients are talking about. What are their mm-hmm. problems? What are the trends in the market? What are the things that they are trying to solve so that, again, you can create better content that leads in the early stage in the funnel. You can help better messaging, all of those things. I have a question there, uh, Dave. How, practically speaking, so when your salespeople are talking to prospects every day, doing demos and all that, and they're, they're listening to discussions, what you know, these prospects are saying, rejections and all that stuff, how do you guys, how is that information passed over to you in marketing or, or the marketing team? Like practically uh, great, speaking. great question. There's a, so we do a couple of ways. Number one, uh, we use sales law. So we okay. actually record most of our sales meetings. So if I wanted sure. to, I can go back and listen to them myself. And I frequently do. Okay. Um, I also have our, the sales reps that handle inbound report up underneath me in the organization. Sure. And again, I think you're seeing a lot of those shifts early more stage in SaaS companies like ours, where mm-hmm. you're, you know, this, this idea of the chief revenue officer is now mm-hmm. very mm-hmm. popular where you have sales and marketing both coming underneath the CRO. Sure. Yeah. We don't have a CRO, but again, I have a small group of salespeople that, that are on my team. So mm-hmm. just intuitively I'm listening to them, right? We're having conversations. I understand what they're talking about. I hop on sales calls. And again, that's where I leverage my sales background. There's many times where we get to the closing stage of the deal I'll hop on a call with an executive to have that sort of peer-to-peer conversation. And it's a great learning opportunity for me. Got um, it, got it. Without going, I know, you know, we try to keep these podcasts pretty short, but if you're looking to check out some information on that, uh, there's a great, uh, a friend of mine named MJ Peters, uh, who has great thoughts on how to collect customer insights. And if you check out her LinkedIn profile, I'll send you a link to it. Uh, yeah. She has a lot of, of, of content she's posted about how to go through that process. I'd love uh, we've to, been yeah. trying to, to, to do some of that ourselves as well. And especially if you're a B2B company, it can be more challenging. But uh, rather than going on a tangent, I'll just direct you to someone that's no, that... smarter, smarter <laughs> than it could be about that topic. And, and, and the reason, no, no, that's, that's great. I'm definitely going to check uh, MJ's content. And the reason I ask is that's something that we, we think of ourselves. Like we are getting a lot of you know, front facing. We are doing you know, 20 demos in a week. And that, that's a ton of data. Uh, that we are gathering that can be passed over to marketing. So, so that's great. And, 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 and this is interesting the way you talk about sales and marketing alignment, because my initial thought is around, you know, just uh, aligning outside of defining your ICP marketing just gives the right kind of content for them to share, but it's, it's, it's more than that. It's more iterative and there's a, right. there's a uh, loop. So let's, let's now talk a little bit about a specific example um, that, that, that we see is you mentioned you have an outbound team that does some outbound outreach uh, right. to, to generate demand. Do you see in your organization um, outbound marketing have an influence on the, on the outreach they're doing? And if yes, how is it, how, how does it work? Like what's the process there? Yeah, no, great question. And I think a lot of companies struggle with that. And, yes. and so just to give you more sort of insight on how we handle it, you know, okay. we have, or I have personally three meetings a week where I'm having conversations with our team. We have one general meeting, which is all company. It's all hands. Sure. And we kind of give de- you know, updates and details. So I'm getting insights and sharing insights there. We have a sales and marketing meeting every week where all our sales team, all of our marketing team gets together. And then I have a third meeting where it's just our executive team. So our sales VP, myself, our CEO are all getting together and having chats. So multiple levels of communication there that, mm-hmm. that helps feed that. But how that relates down to outbound. So um, again, because we are creating a lot of content and a lot of messaging, typically we are helping the outbound team write their scripts. So we use a video heavy, heavy in our outbound. So uh, huh. Vidyard has been a game changer for us. So we use Vidyard videos for every single sequence we have. Um, my team and I help write a lot of that messaging that goes into those videos. Like how do we, you know, how do you give the 10, 15 second, you know, elevator pitch at the start and what should you lead through? How does the demo flow? We help influence that. And then also what content to share. So part of, again, those cycles or those cadences 
we're trying to share our own content through our own system. And again, by, by reiterating, hey, this is how we use it. So that content is again, informed by the things we hear from the market, the trends we're seeing in the market. And so we actually take that and can correlate it to, you know, hey, well, what are our highest performing pieces of content through awareness channels? Because we know, you know, when you're doing outbound, the thing I think most people forget is it's cold. These people yeah, have yeah. no intention to buy, right? Yeah. So just hitting people over the head, trying to say, hey, book a call. If you're doing, you're going to fail if you're doing yeah. that. So how do you provide value? And I honestly look at outbound much more as I would look at like the very early awareness stage of inbound. So if we have a piece of content that works really well on an inbound channel to to say, hey, that's going to entice someone enough to click it, the same is true for outbound, right? So you just reverse the logic and you say, okay, well, hey, if if our top performing piece of content, again, is a 2021 roadmap, why not share that? in our outbound cadence. And so those are some of the ways that we have found that by working together, we're able to apply that logic cross-functionally to help the the other side of the team. So in that case, so you're sort of using outbound as a distribution channel for a good piece of content that you guys use. Correct. Very interesting. Yeah, and Um, and teamed up with personalized videos as well. And do you create personalized videos, like for every person you reach out, you create a 15 second personalized video? That's a good question. So we do a combination. Um, so for instance, if we have, let's say a relatively large list and, and by, and by large, I mean, again, you don't want to email every person in the organization. That's not, it's not effective outbound for each, but when you narrow down to your ICP and then your buyer persona, you ideally want to be emailing those, those type of people. So for us, it's typically people in a director level or above in a sales mm-hmm. and marketing or BD role. So it'd be a director, a manager, all the way up to a vice president or even a CMO, CRO. So uh, what we'll typically do is we'll create a video that's personalized to their organization. So we won't necessarily say their name, but we'll say, hey, um, I'm just going to ABC company. Hey, ABC company, you know, here's something we created for you to help you understand the value. And then we actually take their branding and we create a mock environment inside of our system. And then we walk through it. So every they are seeing their logo. They're seeing their photos. We're pulling up their content. So it feels almost like they're seeing a piece of software that's already created for them. So that's one example. For those where we have a really, really good idea of who the right people, again, in those executive type roles should be, in those cases, we will actually personalize it with their name. And even beyond that, like if we saw that they went to a certain university or, you know, and again, you kind of have, you don't be cheesy, but it's all, I guess, you know, the approach, that's where the art meets the science. But we'll try to relate it something to them as our opening before we go into, you know, the more formal video. So it's a combination and it really Got depends it. on how good of the date, how good the data is for the, the prospects that you're reaching out to. Let me ask you a question specific to the, the strategy that you mentioned where you are using your best performing piece of inbound content to reach out to more top of the funnel, you know, through outbound. What kind of metrics do you see, Dave, in in that effort? Like your goal is, as you mentioned, it's not, it's more awareness and, 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 and getting them through the journey than booking a demo. What kind of metrics do you, do you optimize for in that, those kind of campaigns? Great. This is a timely question because we're actually doing a deep dive on this right now. Okay. (laughs) Our own company. And and one of the things that, you know, you hear a lot of people on podcasts try to say like they have it all figured out. I would be lying to you if I said we all had it figured out. You know, we, we right now, one of the struggles we've had, so we, you know, again, relating back to what we learned in inbound, you know, for, for me and my team, we are constantly focused on what's our click through rate, you know, what's our, our cost per click, you know, what's Mm -hmm. our CPM, all these little, what I call early indicator metrics. Yeah, you know, stuff that you never need to take to your CEO because they're just going to glaze over and go, yeah, why the hell should I care about your, yeah. you know, your EPM, whatever. But it's those are the types of metrics that you can really understand how to optimize your campaigns. Marketing people are really in tune with that by nature, right? Sales, not so much. That's not really how they've traditionally thought. True. One of the things I've actually been doing with our sales team is saying, hey, how can we apply the same logic around understanding how we've taken our inbound cadences and optimize them to really bring our cost per lead down, bring our CPM down, increase our C, uh, click-through rates, and then apply that same logic to our outbound. So now on outbound, we're looking much more heavily at open rates. We're looking much more heavily at click-through rates. We're looking much more heavily at how much video was viewed. Was it 10%? Was it 50? Was it 100? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then certainly we're looking at things like reply rates. Uh, was that reply positive or negative? 
Uh, mm-hmm. So that goes into two buckets. And, but then the ultimate metric is how many demos can you book? Right. Yeah. So you yeah. kind of, you, you can think about it the same way you think about a, uh, an inbound funnel from, you know, awareness to initial conversion to MQL to sales qualified to convert it. The same sort of logic can go into outbound around how those that click through is following. And if you want to get more complicated, then you can also start thinking about the phone. So where we have phone numbers, we try to pick up the phone and, and make calls. So then that can be another metric, right? So, hey, did we get them on the phone? Did we not? And optimizing that to where you can come down. Because for instance, and this is the power of where you get back to like, you know, one or 2%. If, you can, if you're using large scale email lists, if you're bumping your open rates up by two or 3%, that could equate to hundreds of extra eyeballs, yep, right? Yep, and then yep. one or two extra open percent converts to one or two extra percent on reply rate. Well, guess what? Now you just have, you, you may have raised your opportunity or the number of prospects that you could book a meeting with by 33%. So it's th- those single digit percentage improvements really lead to much higher volume when you think about it as it goes down that funnel. As so, a compounding effect. Yeah, that, that, exactly. that makes sense. Do you have any numbers or data points, Dave, if, if someone is doing proper sales and marketing alignment, at least from an outbound perspective with the right kind of content, right kind of messaging versus more generic persona based where everyone is getting the same kind of messaging type outreach? Do you, is there, do you have any baseline metrics where the, the lift that they're getting when yeah. they're... That's a hard one. And, and again, mm-hmm. going back to we're trying to figure it out ourselves, you know, we've done a lot of research lately around what are industry standards. Um, yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm a member of Pavilion, uh, formerly Revenue Collective, Revenue Collective. Yeah. A global you know, group of SaaS executives. And so I reached out to my group there and it's, it's really difficult because you'll find things all over the board. I mean, you'll find some companies that are really doing super hyper segmented outbound that may have open rates that are like 50, 60%, which is like... Yeah mind-blowing yeah. right I, like we we would kill for that ours is like 12 and a half yeah um, okay but you know i would say on average you know every business is going to be different so you have to understand how you're approaching it are you taking a very wide approach then you're going to have to start you know accepting that you know 10 to 15 percent open rates are pretty average if you're taking an extremely narrow extremely targeted extremely personalized approach maybe 50 percent is more of the right number yeah. so it's yeah. hard to give anyone a number and say what is that but I would say overall, big, broad brushstrokes, if you're looking at those open rates, you know, between 10, 15 ish percent, you know, reply rates, again, are going to be down into the high single digits, maybe low double digit percentages. Yeah. Uh, and then book meetings are the hardest. And I think, you know, from and replies, I mean, from that standpoint, I think the the general metric we looked at was like somewhere between one and five percent on on reply and actual positive, books. positive reply. Correct yeah. on positive reply. So again, big broad brushstrokes, but yeah. before before you can pick a metric, you yeah. have to understand what is your strategy and what are you what are you willing to accept as you build that strategy around what outcome you want to drive. So many times people just lick their finger and oh hey that that number we need to go reach that number. Well why? Yeah. <laughs> you know, are you taking a broad approach? Are you taking a negative? It's 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 totally dependent on how you go forward. A hundred percent. Before I let you, there's one question. This is a real example uh, situation that uh, I was in a meeting with the with one of our customers. They're a billion dollar plus revenue company. It's a marketing operations person. Um, so we provide them intent data in telling them, you know, third party intent, telling them, hey, these are the companies that are showing intent. These are the topics they're showing intent on. So when you are getting it to your sales team or your marketing team, the nurture should be specific to the topic that they're showing intent on. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember what she told me was that in theory, that sounds great, but we do not have that many unique pieces of content to send my, give it to my BDR team or my marketing nurture based on the topics they're nurturing. Um, this is a common, I'm guessing this is a pretty common challenge a lot of people are facing when they're trying to come up with, you know, a part of marketing and sales alignment or sales enablement. What, what, what do you say to that? If, if they go, we don't have the resources to create that many unique pieces of content. That's a strategy problem. I mean, mm-hmm. just that's, that's nothing a system is going to solve. That's nothing a, so, a process is going to solve. And again, getting back to where, where is marketing sitting at the company in, in the mm-hmm. company? One thing I see so commonly in big B2B companies is that marketing doesn't have a seat at the executive table. Mm-hmm. Or if they do, it's sort of ceremonial. They're like, ah, marketing is just the coloring in department. So if marketing doesn't have the power to set strategy and have the resources to do that, you're already off on the wrong foot. 
So, you know, and again, like where you can look at that as a way to solve, if you do have resources, um, one of the most common ways we come up with new content ideas is exactly examples like you just described, where someone says, you know, hey, we have this certain thing we're focusing on, we're interested in, and we go, well, hey, do we have content on that? And if the answer is no, then from there, automatically we say, well, okay, we need to define, is that worth us creating content? And a lot of times it is. We have literally created pieces of content for one deal. But if it helps you close one deal, sometimes right, that's worth totally it. worth it. Yeah. Love it. Cool. Thank you so much for your insights, Dave. And I mean, it certainly helped me understand the whole gamut of what sales and marketing alignment means, which is more than just creating the right content and give it to your salespeople. It's, it's a lot more, but uh, appreciate you sharing all these insights. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me on the show. And I'll share with you as well uh, my LinkedIn profile information. If you if have a conversation, reach out to me. We'll and do. I'll also provide you to a link uh, to an uh, article we have about sales and marketing alignment. It could maybe help some of your, your listeners. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, thank you Dave. so much.